Hey, welcome back. <clears throat> so the second part of chapter four, uh, temporality and everydayness, is where we are now. So we've looked at, in the last video, we covered disclosedness, the temporality of disclosedness. And we've got three more um, things to cover. We've got to go through temporality of being in the world, of worldliness, and of spatiality. So we'll hit all of those today. <clears throat> so the uh, the temporality of circumspect taking care is first, and this is this is dealing with uh, being in the world. So what we're looking for here is a connection between taking care, the being of Dasein, and things taken care of. So inner worldly things at hand. And the question really is, how can things be taken care of? <clears throat> how is that even possible? And the answer is temporality. So there's a little chain of reasoning here, which is worth going through. Um, <clears throat> so taking care is predicated on relevance. You remember the, that idea of relevance. Um, uh, everything in a worldly beings are, are all um, interconnected in a web of referential totality significance that uh, and they all play their part if you like in um, in referring to different to different to other inner worldly beings in order to finally get to um, <clears throat> some goal of Daseins. So that's that's relevance and taking care is is predicated on that on relevance. So the relational character of relevance is a together with, right? It's it's built on being together with that web of connections. So if letting things be relevant constitutes the existential structure of taking care, and if the latter as being together with belongs to the essential constitution of care. And if care in its turn is grounded in temporality, then the existential condition of the possibility of letting something be relevant must be sought in a mode of the temporalizing of temporality. Which is quite a long way of just saying, <clears throat> since, since relevance is, um, is, is, is what taking care is, and since taking care as the the the, um, the being of Dasein is in turn grounded on temporality, then that relevance is also grounded in temporality. And that's where we that's that, that's where we're looking now to, to get a deeper understanding of relevance. And thereby a deeper understanding of circumspect taking care, encountering things. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first thing to note is that there is no authentic or inauthentic uh, distinction to be made here. And I think that's because this being in the world is, um, it, it uh, precedes that authentic and authentic distinction. So we, we are in the world, and then we the way we relate to that to that um, situation is can either be authentic or inauthentic. But this is kind of like neutral, I guess, if I can say that. So there's no one authentic authentic distinction, and let's have a look. The three ecstatic modes of taking care or letting something be relevant. The first and, and the, the most important one in this category is, is the present. So Heidegger calls this making present, and basically this just captures the handy way that useful things are encountered. Like with all everything we talked about in that last video too, all of the present, the making present um, ecstatic mode is all about encountering things encountering useful things so that's what this one is that's what the first the first part is uh, the future 
is again an awaiting and um, relevance so we need to remember that relevance has an intentional character there's a uh, um, things become relevant um, in, in a greater web of, um, of references. And so there is, there's some kind of intention behind each instance of relevance. <clears throat> and, and it's that that gives it this, this um, futural sense of awaiting. However, the, this awaiting isn't focused on a goal, so it's not thematic at all. Rather, it's, it's the way that being relevant makes the characteristic absorption and taking care in the world of its useful things possible. So awaiting the intention, um, in awaiting the intention, taking care kind of brings us back to relevance and that's the futural um, aspect to this finally there's the having been and this is Heidegger this Heidegger characterizes as a retaining and forgetting and and um, basically this means retaining the means of relevance while forgetting the self uh, which means becoming lost in the world of tools and using them, becoming lost in in that, and then there, thereby forgetting the self. Um, and that's our uh, having been. So the uh, the summary of that section I have here of those three ecstatic modes is the making present that awaits and retains constitutes the familiarity and accordance with which Dasein knows its way around as being with one another in the public surrounding world. Okay, so that's that. Um, and now I want to I move from there into um, talking about worldliness. So we're going to look at the temporality of the world here. And the title for this section is, it's quite long, um, the temporal meaning of the way in which circumspect taking care becomes modified into the theoretical discovery of that which is present within the world, scientifically, in brackets. And so um, <clears throat> this, this little section looks at the way that, uh, looks at um, objects as as they are for science. And the question Heidegger asked is, how is it possible for Dasein to exist in the mode of scientific investigation? So that's basically Heidegger's way of putting, putting that. We're looking at, at objects, not as they are in our referential totality and, and with relevance, with all their relevance, but we're looking at them as scientific objects. So this basically is aiming at an existential concept of science, i.e. science as a mode of existence and thus a mode of being in the world which discovers or discloses beings or being. <clears throat> and it seems to me that this is quite similar to the way that things are encountered in deficient modes. If you remember um, a long, long time ago, we talked about... Um, circumspect taking care of and <clears throat> we, we saw that things innerworldly things we don't see them as they really are in themselves because we we kind of surpass them f towards um, a greater project so we don't we don't appreciate the hammer for what it is you know, a chunk of of um, of wood with some metal or steel at the end um, we see it as a tool for hammering. So it, it's part of this, um, it's part of a greater project. But when we're talking about things um, in a scientific investigation, then, ah, sorry, but, and just keeping it on the deficiency thing. So that was the way we, we, we approach 
tools, we don't see them as they really are, unless they are deficient in some way. And when they're deficient, remember they're broken or they're missing, and, and that means that we then appreciate them for what they really are. So this, instead of being a hammer, because it's broken and I can't use it, it becomes a chunk of wood, perhaps missing the metal bit at the end. And so that is, <clears throat> that's how things um, appear to us as themselves, through those deficient modes. There are three of them, conspicuousness, um, obtrusiveness, and obstinacy. And basically that's what, that's what science, science does as well. It removes them from, removes things from this referential totality so we can see them as they really are. We can analyze them objectively without this referential totality. Although, except that's not quite right. Um, so it's similar to that, to that, to that, um, that way we approach things when they're deficient. Um, but Heidegger says that that praxis, that practical aspect of the thing doesn't disappear. In the scientific investigation, so there's um, they still retain. They're not completely removed from the referential totality. They're not completely stripped of relevance. They still have that relevance. It's just that because they're not broken. They're not broken. They're not missing. They they're not deficient in any way. So it's not the same as that. But we are still focusing on them within that referential totality, with all of their relevance, but we're focusing on, on the thing as it is. And that's what science does. Um, so Heidegger calls this... So, uh, yeah, so there's a... Rather than a breakdown in relevance, it's more like a, a redirecting of circumspect taking care. So we're kind of re refocusing our... Um, our care onto uh, an object as it is rather than surpassing it for towards our projects or our goals. And Heidegger calls this process, this scientific investigation, this objectifying of, of a thing, he calls it deliberation. Um, <clears throat> And I think that's enough of that. He calls it deliberation. The existential meaning, the, the, the way it, it's temporal interpretation, is the same as that of taking care, which we just looked at. Except, of course, that in taking care, circumspect taking care, the object was encountered um, within that referential totality. Now it's been encountered in a new way. Uh, and transformed into something objectively present, although still within that um, referential totality, with all of its significance and relevance. Uh, he talks about mathematics here as an example of the development of a science, and this is, I think, quite interesting. Um, so there's this... Mm, feeling or impression that mathematics is the language of nature. I think it was Galileo who said the book of uh, the book of nature is written in mathematics. And uh, there was <clears throat> a few decades ago, someone wrote an essay I think entitled "The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics," and it's all this is all kind of acknowledging the, the, the strange um, way that mathematics seems perfectly constituted to describe physical reality. And so, you know, all science is, or all physics, is, is, it's just all math. It describes everything. And, it's, it, and, it, and many people have, have wondered about why nature seems to be so predisposed in a way to um, mathematical interpretation and description. 
and uh, and you know, God is a mathematician. That that's another um, another uh, kind of strand pointing in that direction. How effective maths is when it comes to describing reality. So Heidegger looks at this though and says, actually, mathematics works not by a higher evaluation of the observation of facts nor in the application of mathematics in determining events of nature. But the but it works by or through the mathematical projection of nature itself. And that's a great little um, section. The mathematical projection of nature itself. So what he's saying is, is we don't have um, the world and then this uh, or objective reality and then kind of there's nothing connecting that with mathematics whereas we tend to think that there is something connecting it so so we ask these questions why why does does mathematics perfectly capture reality is reality mathematical in some way or what what's special about maths that 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 means that it can uh, so perfectly describe and capture objective reality. Heidegger is saying that's not the case. The reason it seems like maths is so well disposed to describing reality is because we're, we're projecting nature in a mathematical way. We are projecting nature as mathematical. And... Um, So, if I can just dwell on that for a bit longer. So, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, um, the questions that we ask, the only acceptable answer is a mathematical one. So, we're kind of, we're, we're predefining how the answer must come. And we're, and we're saying that the answer must come in a mathematical way in a mathematical format and then when it does come in a mathematical format we're all surprised and that's amazing how how come it matches that there, there must be some connection but we've already predefined that we're, we'll only accept the mathematical answer so it's that it's that a priori um, demand that the answer to our questions be in a mathematical format that's why maths seems so so um, perfect at describing or for describing reality and measuring reality measurements I mean when you measure something you, you have to use numbers so if we demand that our the answers to our questions um, measure come in a measure in, in, in some kind of measurement then of course we have to use numbers so of course maths must be involved in that but there's nothing special about maths and there's nothing special, especially mathematical, about the universe. It's just that that's what we are demanding. That's, that's the, the language we're demanding and answer it. Um, so maybe I thought of this, this um, analogy. You can, you can decide if it's, if it's helpful or useful or correct. Um, you, if you've got, say... Um, a tree in the distance <clears throat> and the question is um, how far away is that tree so one answer is it's further than that car okay so that that's a fair answer and it's again it's it's this is in a in a in a context in a lived experience experienced context something that um, so it's an answer that we might we might be expected to give or we could reasonably give or it's it's too far it's too far i it's too far to um for me to do something you know i need to do something it's too far away for me to do that so how far how how close is it it's too far it's not close enough that's another answer within um a human life within a within a real context and those are those are acceptable answers I think but 
the answer that we demand is 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 a, is an answer that's removed of any of those um, peripheral uh, considerations. So when we're, we're not really interested in in how that tree stands in a referential context, all we're asking is we're pulling it out of that and saying, look at that thing. How close is it to me, or how far away is it from me? And then the answer will have to be something like, it will have to come in meters. You know, oh, it's it's twenty five point three two meters away. And then when we get that answer, we're surprised because oh, it's mass. That's amazing. How can they? How can they be? Be? Uh, you know, how can they match those two things? But of course they match. It's the only answer you would accept. So we're predefining what we'll accept. And we're predefining it in such a way that it's mathematical in nature. And I think that's what Heidegger is getting at when he says um, we, we go about things with the mathematical projection of nature itself. I like that. Uh, and he goes on to say nature is being uncovered in light of a mathematical horizon. A project whose acceptable limits are defined a priori. Which is really cool and interesting. <clears throat> so he calls this prior project of the constitution of the being of beings in the mode of scientific investigation, thematization. So the, the way that um, deliberation, which is... Um, the scientific approach, the way that deliberation predefines um, beings before it before it analyzes them, before it gets its answers, the way it predefines them and, and, and delineates what kind of answer it will accept, he calls that thematization. And he says thematization objectifies. It does not first posit beings, but frees them in such a way that they become objectively subject to questioning and definition. So it doesn't it doesn't ask what things are um, and let them reveal themselves to us as they are. It asks what things are within this horizon, within this mathematical context. And then it gets the answers. Um, and yeah, so that that's how, that's the scientific approach. And then we go from there, that's the scientific approach to, to world and its connection to um, circumspect taking care. And we go from there to the temporal problem of the transcendence of the world. And this is about the relation between Dasein and world. So, since being together with innerworldly beings is possible, the question is, in what way must the world be such that Dasein can exist as being in the world? So, yeah, so we're looking at, at what the world is. And the answer should come as no surprise, now the world is temporal, fundamentally. And there's another little chain of reasoning here, which I'll just run through quickly. The totality of relevance in circum circumspect taking care is made up of a number of relations, the in order to, the what for, etc. The connection of these relations is significance, and their unity is world. Since world is disclosed in the disclosedness of Dasein, and Dasein is grounded in temporality, the unity of significance, or world, must also be grounded in temporality. This must mean that temporality has something like a field within which Dasein is able to project itself upon its possibilities, and Heidegger calls this field a horizon. So, Another quite long um, spiel, but basically all it's saying is um, relevance is 
the, the totality of relevance and taking care is made up of those connections, which we've looked at before um, in significance. Uh, the, the unity of all of those relations between different things is what the world is. And since world is only disclosed through Dasein, and since Dasein is fundamentally temporality, then that world, that unity of those relations of relevance and significance, uh, which is world, is also grounded in temporality. <clears throat> and that temporality, um, because it, it uh, allows things to be disclosed to Dasein, there must be something like a field clearing a space in which those things can be disclosed and that is what Heidegger is calling horizon and since temporality is a threefold ecstatic structure then this horizon must also be threefold and he calls this the horizontal uh, sorry the horizontal schema three three um, aspects the future Having been in the present, the futural aspect is the for the sake of itself. The having been is in the face of which, and the present is in order to. And I, I think they kind of um, map on to what we've already looked at in, in terms of that the, uh, the significance the referential totality, where <clears throat> all of those those relations between things, they they um, they are in order to right. So you've got the hammer, which is used in order to nail, and the nail is used in order to keep the wood, two pieces of wood together, etc., etc., until you get finally to uh, for the sake of which, which is for Dasein, maybe to to um, <clears throat> have a house to, to, to shelter within. And uh, and the, the, the only new one there really is the having been, which is in the face of which. And I think that that is reasonably straightforward in the face of which, like um, with the the past, again, slipping back into that, that language, the past that we have, with that, all of these things have this connection in order to, and then finally, um, for the sake of Dasein. Although, again, don't forget, none of this, this isn't happening over time. This is all co-occurring. This is all co -occurring. So, and then Heidegger goes on to say that insofar as Dasein temporalizes itself, the world is and is temporalized as well. And I think those those three temporal, the 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 horizontal schema, for the sake of itself, in the face of which, and in order to, uh, they're all connected with Dasein, obviously, and and Dasein's projects. And I think that reflects the way that um, the world. Remember, for, for Heidegger, is not separate from Dasein. Rather, it's it's the two are, are intimately connected, um, and so the horizontal schema of the world has this has these um, characteristics which kind of reflect right back on Dasein, and I th that's seems to me kind of evidence of, of of that connection between the two. We can't just look at the world independent of Dasein. Um, he goes on to say that the world is transcendent, and by that he just means it, it transcends the entities which make it up, which make, make it up. So the um, it's the world is the unity of those relations and the things in it 
And in that sense, it transcends them. So the world is transcendent and grounded in the horizontal unity of ecstatic tempor temporality. Um, there is a little bit of tension here, I think, though, um, about just how how far we can take this idea of the world being temporal and Dasein being temporal. And I think William Blattner in this book, I, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, one of the, the I think the first video, Heidegger's Temporal Idealism. I'm pretty sure, I can't remember exactly, but I think he talks about um, the way Heidegger describes Dasein as having this, this temporal structure. But the world also is having this temporal structure. And the two just kind of marry up quite nicely. Um, and he argues that Heidegger never gives a reason for this. There's no explanation for why the world and Dasein seem so temporally um, well, dis well disposed to each other. Why they... they they match so nicely, although it, there, you know, again, it seems that um, the two aren't separate. So surely Heidegger is not getting at. Um, he's he's not saying that the world is temporal and Dasein's temporal, in in a way that that matches. Surely I, I think his idea is that there is like the temporality, is like the root of both. Dasein and the world. And so, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's hazy, it's hazy. This is, this is my, my best, best effort, but my head is spinning right now. Um, let me just keep going and finish with uh, a little quote from this, this last bit about the world. The relations of significance that determine the structure of the world are thus not a network of forms that is imposed upon some material by a worldless subject. And that's pretty much um, directed at, at Kant, Immanuel Kant, who thought that um, <clears throat> the forms of you know time and space, causality, and nine other structures that that, that um, or nine other categories that structure human experience weren't in the world itself, but they were in us, and so we kind of impose those categories on the on the world, whatever it might be, whatever the world is, in its in its raw form. We impose those categories and and so bring structure to the world, and uh, and Heidegger's denying that here when he says that the um, the relations of significance that determine the structure of the world are not a network of forms imposed upon the world by a worldless subject. So um, rather. Factical Dasein, ecstatically understanding itself and its world in the unity of the there, comes back from these horizons to the beings encountered in them. And there it sounds a little bit like he is talking about a separate world, but again, I'm sure he, he can't be, because it's crucial to Heidegger's thought that, that the world is not independent of Dasein. So it must it must be um, something, temporality is something that both Dasein and the world participate in uh, and which structures both Dasein and the world um, in such a way that it's it's not being, you know, we're not imposing those structures on uh, on the material of the world. Rather, there is uh, the the those structures in in terms of temporality pre-exist that they, they are what we they they are how Dasein operates and how Dasein exists and how Dasein discloses the world to itself. 
Man, okay. Let me just finish up the last section, the temporality of the spatiality characteristic of Dasein. So remember that the spatiality of Dasein, making room, is not a being present in space, but is rather constituted by a directionality and de-distancing which discover a region. So we talked about this a while ago. This is uh, the spatiality of Dasein. <clears throat> so a region is where innerworldly beings belong. Right? It has that character of belongingness, and as such is characterized by circumspect taking care of, that is, practical considerations within that referential totality, within significance. And this means that region is always discovered within a context of relevance of the useful things taken care of. And, as we have already seen, relevant relations are intelligible only in the horizon of a disclosed world. So, basically, this is what Heidegger is saying, is that the horizontal schema of temporality, therefore, makes possible the specific horizon of the where to of regional belonging. And even more clearly than that, spatiality is grounded in temporality. That's basically what he's saying here. So again, temporality is at the is at the root of everything. So it all boils down to temporality. Even spatiality. And he gives a, a quick horizontal schema of making room. Um, the future is an awaiting of region and that is that's manifested in that de-distancing we talked about many many videos ago um, the making present of region is the directionally discovering region again we talked about that many many videos ago and the final thing um, the having been aspect ecstatic mode is um, forgetfulness forgetting again so this this occurs in bringing close and making possible the handling and taking care of things which entangles Dasein making it forget itself okay man I hope that made some kind of sense to you that is uh, really tough going as you can see so um yeah that's my best effort if it's still hazy sorry it's hazy for me as well but we've got two more chapters to get through so um okay let's see how we go anyway thanks for listening it really is great um i really enjoy getting feedback and seeing your responses and um yeah i really appreciate you guys um sticking sticking with this and hopefully these are clarifying things um, for you somewhat. But but yeah, like I said, next next time we'll uh, we'll look at chapter five. Two more to go. Thanks again. See you next time.